Welcome to another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Gus Vickery. He's a board-certified family physician who specializes in personalized health consultations focused on total body and mind optimization. He's also a speaker and the author of Authentic Health. He founded Vickery Family Medicine in 2005, which has grown to multiple medical providers serving in two locations, including the clinic at Biltmore, an innovative direct-to-employer clinic for the Biltmore Company. He offers personalized health consultations both virtually and in person at his office in Asheville, North Carolina. He uses advanced biometrics, genetics, hormonal assessments, metabolic and nutritional assessments, and other advanced diagnostics to determine the proactive and comprehensive strategies that will help his clients experience their best health and lifespan. More information is available at drgusvickery.com. Dr. Vickery is an honor graduate of the Medical College of Georgia. He's a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society and teaches medical students for the Department of Family Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Welcome to the show, Dr. Vickery. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I'm so happy to be here with you. (laughs) Tell me your story. Well, I know your story, but tell the audience your story, how you became so passionate about total body and mind optimization. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a family physician. You're, I think you originally trained as a family nurse practitioner. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, we go into family medicine because we're already hopefully passionate about health. We want to see healthy communities. We want the people we care for to experience great health. We understand what health does for somebody. Um, It might be the most important attribute you can have in life is to have great health. Um, And so, you know, early on, I I went through traditional medical training, went through residency, had great experiences and started my own practice right right out of residency and entered into the usual flow of traditional medicine, seeing people, diagnosing conditions, treating them with medications and trying to give them good advice. But, you know, in that portion of my career within the first five to seven years, which you're really primarily just trying to become competent at what you're doing and not hurt people, you know, you start, we, we were seeing this upward trend in chronic disease, as you know, and, and I was seeing a lot of individuals coming in, including younger, what we think of as healthy people who were just not feeling good. And it was when we were beginning to see a lot of fibromyalgia and migraine syndromes and anxiety and mental health issues were worsening. And then the people with metabolic disease, we had these tools, these pharmaceuticals, and that's what we were trained to use. So we'd use them and we'd see improvement. Their A1C would come down and we'd, you know, hey, that's great. And then a year later, of course, it was worse again. And you realize, wait a second, either human systems are just fundamentally frail and oriented to disease, and this is just par for the course for human beings, or there's something really, really wrong with what's going on in our population health. And I think most of us know there's, got, there's something wrong, right? That if you look at a human being anthropologically, we're robust, anti-fragile creatures. We should have very good health spans, life spans. Robust, anti-fragile creatures. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's what we should be for the most part. I mean, things happen that you couldn't control for, but generally speaking, if those things don't happen, we should be generally in very good health and feeling good most of the time. And so I had to dig deeper, like a lot of good, a lot of clinicians do. I, you know, started studying nutrition and more biochemistry and then looking into other aspects and environment. And you just begin, and as you would read and learn, you would begin to incorporate this into your patient encounters and, you know, people with bad, you know, really bad, uh, significant insulin resistance, maybe you put them on a low carb, high fat diet, even though that sounded like anathema based on my training, it was, yeah, no, let's just try this and see if it works because these other doctors are doing it and they're getting these amazing results and you see that it works. And there are other individuals that do great with carbs. So I'm not like a, everybody should be on a low carb diet, but there's a population of people that clearly thrive. And, you know, basically bit by bit, increasing my learning and understanding and then applying it to my patients who were kind enough to let me safely experiment on them over time. What I found was that as they begin to apply these lifestyle strategies and address, you know, uh, systems that weren't working well within their own, own body, they begin to get healthier. Metabolic disease was reversing, migraines improved, their sleep improved and, and, you know, and their whole, you know, quality of life improved. And I also realized that these folks want to feel good. They're not coming in complaining just because they're complaining, or they're not just coming in and complaining because they want another medicine, which is a lot what a lot of people think the population wants. They're just looking for a, a quick fix. I mean, some people are, but I realized the vast majority of these people, they, they want to feel good. They want solutions. They're just not, the only option they're given is here's a prescription or, you know, a, a token, well, try to improve your diet. What does that mean exactly? Mm-hmm. 
And so a philosophy of health developed for me where I, I began to really believe, of course, that the human being is, in fact, robust, anti-fragile, oriented to health. And if they have the right information and the right support, uh, they can basically move in that direction. And obviously, diagnostic tests, you use diagnostic, diagnostic tests, I use diagnostic tests. So if we get more comprehensive with how we assess a human system, we can be much more precise and have the guidance we give people for their unique human systems. Well, let's get into some of that guidance, but be first, but first, let's talk about what metabolic health is and why is it such an important focus in our human systems? Yeah, so, you know, obviously there's all these different aspects of health, but when you think about metabolic health, there's a lot of different definitions of metabolic health, but the way I think about it is really how is your body, how are your, how are your cells and tissues, how are they able to utilize energy and dispose of energy properly, right? And so obviously energy is the fundamental currency of life. We have to be able to use it properly and also manage the byproducts of creating it. Um, and, and to uh, stay healthy. And one of my main focuses, one of the main reasons I focus on metabolic health is that was just sort of the defining condition I was, or issue I was seeing in my practice. People who could not lose weight, kept gaining weight, who had insulin resistance and elevated uric acid and dyslipidemia. And then of course, all the ways that connects to cancer risk, dementia risk, vascular disease risk. So you start looking at all the things that are, are the, you know, the, 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 the things that are most likely to kill people in our population. And every single one of them has a strong tie into metabolic health. And so, you know, you so when you begin to look at a human system from that standpoint, to me, it just kind of became the cornerstone of everything else. Like if, if I can, if, I, if you're an expert on hormones, among other things, but if all I do is take a, you would fix your hormones, perhaps, whether it's through supplements or through direct hormone replacement, but I ignore the insulin resistance and every other thing affecting your system, you're not going to get a great outcome from that, right? And so it's really important that we focus in on our metabolic health. And I'm not suggesting that everybody has to have like a awesome body composition, meaning they're, they've got six pack abs and great, but there is a healthy body composition for everybody. And based on population health statistics at that time, most people are not experiencing healthy body composition. And that directly ties in to the metabolic health piece as well. And so if we can help people optimize in, a, in the right way, their body composition without getting too caught up in exactly what that looks like for them and optimizing their, their body's ability to be metabolically flexible, use energy correctly, dispose of that energy properly, they're going to have a lot better health and they're going to have a lot less issues with the other, uh, you know, conditions that can affect them. Um, you might not know off the top of your head, but do you know any statistics uh, just regarding the prevalence of metabolic disease? Like in the U.S. Yeah, right now? So there's some really good studies. Um, and one of the ones I like, it came, I'm pretty sure this was the Chapel Hill study. It was a large population, I think seven or 8,000 people and it included like adolescents. And they used five different uh, metrics to assess metabolic health. So they didn't just look at, of course, you know, a fasting blood glucose. They looked at triglycerides. They looked at weight. They, um, and, and anyway, long story short, they found that seven out of, seven out of eight people had at least one finding that indicated their metabolic health was not optimal. They may not, they may not have all been metabolically sick, but they were not medically metabolically optimized. Sure. And so that's 88% of the population. And then there was oh. another, yeah. And then, so there was another study and it was, and the, the definition they used was over fat. And, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of people who struggle with obesity and I'm very sensitive to the psychological impact of that and how obesity is probably something that happened to them, not something they chose for themselves. And we know that folks who've had lifelong obesity, they can lose weight and get healthier, but they're, they, they may never get to the kind of weight that we would like to think of. So I'm very sensitive to how we communicate with individuals about these topics. But anyway, at this study, they were just looking at over fat, not just from a BMI perspective, but body composition and specifically visceral fat. And the end result, and I cannot remember, I can get this data for you because I, I presented it recently, but it was in an uh, adult population and the, it was close to 90% of people were over fat. And Holy smokes. Yeah, and specifically it was focusing on visceral fat primarily. Mm -hmm. And so what they were identifying is that you know, 90% of adults have some degree of, or some amount of visceral fat that really is not healthy for them. Which is fat around your organs for the listeners, yeah. just so they know, <laughs> know what we're talking about. Well, that's astounding. Wow. 80 to 90% sounds like, yikes. So yeah. 
But my next question to you was going to be, what biometric data points can we use to evaluate metabolic health? And you kind of just mentioned a few of those, but can you tell the listeners, even for their, for them to get a glimpse into if they are struggling with this, which based on the statistics, they probably are, but what labs could they have their primary care provider draw on them to kind of evaluate their metabolic health? Yeah, this is critically important because if you're just relying on what your insurance considers preventative care, you're not getting the metrics that matter. Um, I, I really, you know, this is like a stone in my shoe kind of thing. It really bugs me that um, we're doing this. We're waiting until people have measurable blood sugar issues, meaning they're pre, pre-diabetic, if not diabetic, to have told them that they have insulin resistance and that maybe 10 years ago, they could have reversed it by just exercising more. So anyway, to get to the to answer the question, obviously a fasting blood glucose is a helpful metric. You can look at a fasting blood glucose, but there's a lot of variability in fasting blood glucose. Some people have very healthy um, you know, glycemic control, but have a high cortisol push in the morning. So their blood sugar is a little higher than other folks. So you can't just rely on a fasting blood glucose. You can also look, of course, at hemoglobin A1C. That also can be variable, but that's going to give you a better idea of glycemic variability, meaning this three-month average of blood sugar control. Uh, you know, I had a case this morning before I saw you, the fasting blood glucose was 90, not too bad, but the A1C was 5.7, borderline pre-diabetic. We know that that individual probably after they're eating certain foods is having significant elevated blood glucose, which is not good for them. All right, so we understand that. And then a fasting insulin, of course, because mm-hmm. if before, you know, if you develop classic insulin resistance before the glucose gets out of control, the insulin will start to rise. So if you see an elevated, you see a normal blood glucose and even an A1C that maybe is in the mid fives, but a high fasting insulin, you know, that person's likely already insulin resistant. The beta cells are already working harder to try and maintain, maintain stable blood sugar. And then you can look at lipids. Lipids can tell you an enormous amount about insulin resistance. And often you'll see it in lipids before you see it in blood glucose and insulin and A1C. So I'm the first time, when I first sit down with someone, I'm always dissecting their lipids first. So you can look at HDL and triglycerides and the ratio of triglycerides to HDL. And that can tell you a lot about metabolic health. There are some genomics that influence HDL levels that you might not be able to account for for some individuals, but generally a triglyceride to HDL level should be less than two to one. Um, and preferably even less than that. And then you can look at particles like small dense LDL. Small dense LDL is your smallest densest form of LDL. It's the most potentially atherogenic form of LDL. If Mm -hmm. you're in a plaque forming state, small dense can become part of plaque pretty easily. But when you look at your total SDLDL, but more importantly, the percent of your LDL that's small dense, that can be one of the first indications you're moving in an insulin resistant direction. And to make it more complicated, you can also look at other peripheral markers like uric acid and ferritin, which will often start to rise when people have insulin resistance before blood sugar has become problematic. And you can look at visceral fat if you're able to measure it using DEXA or other measures. The next step to really pin down glucose, of course, you can get into glucose tolerance tests. Most mm-hmm. people aren't going to get those, but those will catch it even before everything else I just stated. Yeah. <laughs> so you can go to that level. And if you can get a lab to do it, you can do a glucose tolerance test where you measure both glucose and insulin. insulin. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I do. And then yep. you're really, really going to catch it early. But it's not feasible for most people to be able to get those particular tests. For individuals who aren't likely, I'll often get my patients to make a modest financial investment and a continuous glucose meter. And then we'll, we can have them do their own kind of form of a home glucose tolerance test. And we can get that 24 hour glycemic variability curve and begin to see, are they already having particular, you know, what is their carb tolerance? Or maybe it's stress. Maybe it's when they don't sleep well and we're seeing glucose issues. Mm-hmm. So I know that was long winded, but you, I hope that, yep. yeah, well, yeah, it gets the idea. You really want to get a more complete picture. And I break all of those, most of those labs down in chapter seven of my book, Your Longevity Blueprint as well. Just want to point that out. Which um, has become the, the main book I point people to who, who need to go deeper than where I'm taking them on some of these topics, by the way, Stephanie. Well, thank you. Because it's so great the, how simple it is and straightforward and how you took these very complex things and broke them down and made it really easy for people. And so when, when uh, people are really needing a, a helpful guide and I'm talking to them about hormones or toxicity or these other things, your book is the one I'm like, just get Stephanie's book. That's why we keep selling it. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So what are the most effective strategies for reversing metabolic disease and really optimizing our metabolic health? I know you could probably talk for an hour about this, but kind of what are some of the most effective strategies? Yeah. So th- there's a lot. It's, it's obviously a comprehensive 
uh, in terms of the health is a comprehensive approach. But the, the two main, I mean, time tested, do work strategies that, I mean, and again, there are other things that you have to pay attention to that could sabotage it. But it, the two biggest levers you pull on it are your physical activity and your nutrition, mm -hmm. right? I mean, those yep. are the two main focuses. And, you know, several years ago, my focus was like, if, if, you know, I looked at both as equally important and they are, they're both necessary. You can't just do one at the expense of the other. But if you looked at it as a seesaw or like an order of priority, I would have probably weighted it more 60, 65% your approach to eating and nutrition and 35% your approach to fitness and physical activity. My seesaw has tilted in the last year mm -hmm. based on both clinical data that's been coming out about actually reversing insulin resistance at early stages and also some mentors I have that have become real experts at reshaping body composition for people with obesity and my seesaw is now physical activity takes the higher priority and nutrition comes second now mm -hmm. both are important but if I had a patient and this doesn't happen but if I had a patient he said I'm only going to do one you have to pick which one I would actually get them physically training uh, before I would necessarily shift, change their diet, but you should attend to both. Wow. Well, yeah. let, let's talk about diet changes. I know you're a fan of intermittent fasting. We've talked a little bit about that on the podcast and a ketogenic diet. Uh, so talk a little bit about some of the nutritional strategies you recommend to patients. Maybe those are included amongst that. Yeah. So I mean, I have, you know, three foundational principles of eating that apply to everyone, regardless of the diet you're going to follow. Um, and I know you have these same principles. One is, of course, mindfulness of eating. You have to really become mindful about eating. If you're mindless, you're going to have problems with our modern food environments. Um, the second is, um, you know, uh, uh, food sourcing. You know, your food needs to be whole, nutritional, you know, all that. We all understand that. Limiting processed foods, foods that contain a lot of high fructose corn syrup and high omega-6 fatty acids that drive eating behavior and drive blood sugar issues. And then the third, of course, is balancing feeding and fasting, right? And so the, the timing of your eating and how much you're eating uh, is really important. So those are like the, the, the foundation. You've got to get those three things right, it, regardless if you're going anti-inflammatory with autoimmune paleo or you're going, you know, whatever you're, you're choosing. But specifically for metabolic health, most of these individuals do have insulin resistance, and many of them have measurable blood sugar issues. And when individuals are in that state, regardless of what, say, their genomics would say about macronutrient utilization of their body, we know that they're probably going to do better with a lower carbohydrate diet, with the very least getting rid of simple sugars and, you know, refined carbs and all of the things that most people understand. But most people likely will uh, improve their uh, blood glucose, reduce inflammation, and begin to develop some metabolic flexibility if they lower carbohydrate intake, deplete some glycogen. So I will usually move them in that direction. And I do believe that when it comes to reversing insulin resistance, or especially people who already have uh, type 2 diabetes with significant blood glucose issues, if they can tolerate it, ketogenic diets are very effective for that. And so I'll often use a ketogenic diet if the person is willing to go there, if they can go there. Um, you know, I don't believe that necessarily a person would need to be on a ketogenic diet all their life. They could mm -hmm. be for different reasons, but I do believe it can be used as a medicinal diet for people who have insulin resistance and blood sugar issues. So I'll usually yep. move in that direction, but then I'm very cautious with the fats. Um, they might really have saturated fat concerns based on their lipids and other factors. And so we might need to be careful with how much saturated fat. And then I definitely talk a lot about polyunsaturated fats. So try to get people, of course, more omega-3s. Most people are deficient. But I measure in fatty acid balance tests. I do measure in the cell membranes. You probably do the same thing. And there's an epidemic of high linoleic acid in cell membranes. And we, you know, we don't have like clinical endpoints on it yet, but mechanistically, we know that high linoleic acid, high concentrations do drive the eating. It dysregulates satiety. It increases the lipostat for fat storage. It creates an insulin resistant state. We also know that pre-industrialization, the only higher linoleic acid foods would have been nuts and seeds. I'm not saying nuts and seeds are bad, um, but those, because we really, we did not have vegetable oil, corn oil, soybean mm -hmm. oil, safflower, sunflower oil, and all those oils. Obviously linoleic acid is also present in chicken and olive oil and things like that too, but it's just not in higher concentrations. So it's not just that if we go ketogenic and we're trying to lower carbs so we can fix this problem, we really do focus on the fat composition of the diet. Okay, I wanna go back to exercise for a moment, since you're putting heavier weight on that from a mm -hmm. training standpoint, uh, in a few minutes, what would you share? Is it really important to incorporate with physical activity and training? 
Yeah. So, you know, it's all important, obviously, just generally being more physically active and, and less sedentary. And some people will disagree with me on this. So this is all an, an evolution of our learning. And we're doing these experiments with our patients and we're watching their responses. But I've really gotten into strength training um, for people who are metabolically sick. And what I've found, they need to lose weight. And, they all, and it's going to be hard for them to lose weight because their fat flux is all screwed up because of high insulin and high inflammation. So they're really having a hard time accessing stored fatty acids. They're at great risk of beginning to lose lean body mass when they lower their calories because of that situation. And what I have found is that if you take somebody who does need to lose visceral fat, improve their body composition, reverse metabolic disease, and that's all intertwined that you simultaneously can lower their calories to create calorie deficit. You can use fasting for that too, of course. Make sure they get adequate protein. It's really important during that time because if they don't get enough protein, they're gonna get ravenous and they're gonna have a hard time maintaining lean body mass. But if you push them into the gym to strength train and you create that stimulus on the muscles, bones and connective tissues that we've gotta keep our strength and maybe even mm -hmm. build our strength while we're doing this, what I've seen is people can simultaneously get stronger while they're dropping fat, which is not easy to do for the human system. It prefers to do one or the other, gain or lose. But when people need to really lose weight, it can do it. And what I've seen happen is that as they build up their muscle mass, we know they're increasing their metabolic rate, which actually helps them to be able to you know, eat more when they finish their whatever weight they've lost. And also, as you know, the best glucose disposal tissue in the human system is muscle, right? Mm -hmm. So the more activated muscle you have on your body, the more bigger glucose disposal tank you have when you eat foods that will create a glucose, uh, you put glucose in the bloodstream. So I've really moved in the direction if I'm going to choose one form of structured exercise. And again, this is specific to this context. I want to be clear. We're talking about a context of optimizing metabolic health. I'm going to actually push them to focus on strength training while they do the dietary interventions I'm describing. But I will emphasize, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be taking walks or playing tennis and playing with their dog and doing all the other things we should do, right, to get good physical activity. And if they're willing to add one more onto it, I'll do the high intensity intervals, right? So I'll, but if they're only gonna do one or the other, I'm gonna choose strength for that initial push while we're trying to rechange, to improve metabolic health. Simply stated, <laughs> you, want, you want your patients to lift weights to gain muscle because muscle burns fat, right? Yes. Muscle burns burn fat. Sugar. Yeah, fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it takes up glucose. It lowers <laughs> yes. the blood glucose. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Back to nutrition for a minute here. So a lot of people would like to improve their nutrition and lose weight, but struggle with managing hunger and eating behavior. So do you have strategies to help them succeed there? Yeah, this has actually been, I mean, the, the great thing that happened in the earlier part of the practice when I started really looking at this obesity issue is I had a lot of opportunities just to have conversations with people and learn about what was going on with their eating behavior. And, you know, a lot of them have a lot of guilt and shame because they think that they lack willpower, that they're just undisciplined. Of course they don't. They, I mean, they have willpower just like everybody else. It's just that it's, it's, it struggles in this one particular area. And so I, you know, and I didn't have any science to support it, but I just kept trying things that would maybe make sense. And sometimes they worked and we'd keep trying them with other folks. And now we have a lot of good science about hunger sensing and how you, what is the gut sensing for when you eat and what can create satiety. And, you know, the first thing, and this is back to, you know, primarily the behavior, we know this, somebody who really struggles with eating behavior, if they go to a whole food, natural diet, whole food, I'm not talking about plant-based or anything like that, I'm just gonna be an omnivore diet, but every, their food is, whole, natural, minimally processed, that fixes it right there. If food is hydrating, fibrous, nutrient dense, a little lower in calories, adequate protein, that will create satiety signaling. It will not, the, the lack of hyper palatability of it will not override the satiation function of your body and cause you to binge eat. You just, it, it controls it right there. So, that, you know, that's step one, choosing whole foods. But a lot of folks in the moment where they're struggling with craving, they know that, but they really want to choose the not, you know, what, whatever, the, the Danish or the whatever else it is. And that's, you know, a big portion of that's hedonic eating. So, when you um, get to a point where you're primarily eating for some emotional reason, right? You have, you, you, the first thing is that that's very powerful. We know that. And you are probably going to lose that battle if you just rely on willpower alone, right? You're probably not going to have what it takes. You might through the first part of the day, you get to the late part of the day and you've lost it. So you have to stack the deck in your favor. And the first thing you do, of course, is make sure you're hydrated. 
right? Because a lot of times hunger is hydration and make sure that provided you're not over salted that you have adequate minerals in your human system, right? So mineralized water, mineralized beverages that'll at least take care of that piece that you're not really seeking salt. You're not just seeking fluids, right? So that's gonna help a little bit with satiety. And then there's the really important piece of mindfulness. You basically know that you've got particular triggers. You know what a craving feels like. You understand that this is causing you problems. And if you don't really stop and develop a plan for yourself, what you're going to do when this happens and really engage your higher mind that can kind of give you some self-determination, you're going to struggle. And you have to recognize, so you're seeking something. I mean, a lot of times people carb crave because there's carbs are higher in tryptophan and they get serotonin, right? They're really looking for serotonin. They want to feel better. You know, might be looking for dopamine. Sugar can create dopamine. So, you know, understand what are you really looking for? Um, and, and then can you get it a different way? And you can. You can get serotonin through alternative mechanisms. You can get it through a good conversation with a friend, playing music, dancing, walking in nature for 20 minutes. But you can also take amino acid supplements. You can go ahead and take tryptophan. Um, some people might need 5-hydroxytryptophan. Many will just do fine with tryptophan. And that tryptophan will enter your system and it will go to the brain the same way the tryptophan and the carbohydrates would have. And it will actually help facilitate serotonin production. So I, I'll give people these little tricks. And I know it, we don't have time to go into every little trick, but if it's dopamine, then we have an amino acid and we have a strategy, exercise, breath work, things that will actually improve dopamine and adrenaline and turn off hunger. And so we begin mm -hmm. to identify what are they really looking for? And how can we give it to them without them giving into the craving? And then the mindfulness piece is them recognizing when the craving happens, they still rather would eat the rich sugary carbs than take tryptophan and go take a walk in nature. They would rather the one than the other. But if they recognize that 30 minutes from now, they can make either choice and the craving will be gone. The craving mm -hmm. will have been yep. satisfied. It'll no yep. longer be a problem for them. But they have a choice that 30 minutes from now it can be because they actually did something very helpful for their brain and helped them to feel good and that they got to the same end point or they went and they gave into the thing that made them feel terrible. And so that's the mindfulness piece where they keep recognizing what are they really after. They use some little tips and tricks to kind of fool the body, not really, just giving it what it's looking for. And then they know when they get to that 30 minute point, craving is yep. gone. Yeah. Yep. That's so good. Love that. I want to come back to mindfulness too, but first, what are some other influencers of metabolic health other than nutrition and physical activity, which we've kind of, you know, talked about for the most of this interview? Yes. What are the other influencers? I mean, if I have to pick the top one, it's sleep, right? Okay. If you're not getting enough sleep, you're sabotaged. You know, I mean, if you like, and in fact, sleep probably should be ahead of physical activity and nutrition in a way, but you can't, you really, you know, you can't sort it out. But yeah, if you don't prioritize and get the restorative sleep your body needs, that you're going to, on multiple levels, you're going to struggle. You will have, we've got studies showing clearly blood sugar is higher, stress signals are higher, you're going to have more dysregulation metabolically. Secondly, your brain's tired, you're more moody, mm -hmm. you're more emotional, you're more likely to give into cravings. You're just totally, you're gonna, yep. You, yeah. So sleep is number one. Stress, obviously. Um, stress is not all bad. Stress is good, but when it's too much, too often, or you feel like you have no control over it, then it's problematic. And how are you going to be proactive and how you approach stress and stressors that occur? And how are you going to have good strategies to manage that? Um, and so that your autonomic nervous system is well balanced and, you know, not hypersympathetic or hyper-parasympathetic. And then finally, environment, you know, toxins. I mean, basically making sure that your air, your water, your food, what you're drinking out of, what your food is stored in, what you put on your skin, what you like, you know, you've got a low or toxicant burden, or that will absolutely through backdoor mechanisms, completely sabotage weight loss and getting healthy. So let's break those three down, spend a little more time on each of those. So do you track your sleep? Like I wear aura ring. I do. I, I, do. I have yeah. tracked it for years. My aura ring battery finally went dead <laughs> <laughs> and I was about to order a new one, but you know, for the last two and a half years, I've had identical data 90% of the time. That's great. Good data. Yeah. I assume. So yeah, I, exactly. I, yeah. yeah. And the most important metric for me from the aura, aura ring, my sleep data was great, but it was the heart rate variability data. Mm -hmm. And I found a different device with an app where I could get more heart rate variability data. Sure. And so I decided that I was just going to kind of run with that. But the aura ring made a huge, my, my sleep metrics improved dramatically by tracking sleep. So to get more REM and deep sleep specifically, what are a few strategies? And maybe this actually goes into the second point, which is more stress reduction. But, but yeah. what are your top tips for improving deep and REM sleep, sleep quality in general? Yeah, it always starts with sleep hygiene. 
right? And I think you've probably shared that with your audience plenty of times, right? Dark, comfortable, safe, quiet, cool environment, right? And then of course, the lead up to sleep, you've got to settle your brain down. So your lighting yeah. environment prior to bedtime, what are you doing? Are you watching new cable news and geeking out because the world's going to you know, blow up tomorrow? Or are you relaxing, reading something, having a nice conversation with a family member, maybe doing some journaling, something that's much more, you know, soothing to the mind and the body? Um, you know, having those routines is really, really important because your body wants to sleep. You know, mm -hmm. we're the ones who disrupt the sleep. The body is geared to want to sleep. And so that, you know, the environment is the main thing. And then it depends if, a, if an individual is really struggling, maybe because we have sleep genomics and we can look and some individuals will have sleep latency issues that are based in genetics. And some people have very high sleep disruption based on genomics. They're very vigilant at night. And so we have to figure out ways to, we can try and help their brain feel more relaxed. Breath work is a great tool. Mm -hmm. Essential oils can be very helpful. I do find that certain supplements can really help. Magnesium glycinate or magnesium three and eight is like a yep. mainstay of mine. I'll yep. almost always yep. start with that because I know that it's good for the system. You're not going to hurt anybody. And most people are magnesium deficient anyway, right? So we know that's safe. I will try melatonin, but I have to be very careful with it because you can you can actually do too much with melatonin and some people don't have great response. Yep. Um, and so I, I'm real cautious with melatonin, but I'll use it if we need to. Definitely things like phosphatidylserine that mm -hmm. can be helpful, lemon balm that can be helpful. And yep. I try not to, you know, they have sleep formulas where it's like 18 things. I really try to be precise and start with, you know, the things that I think. One or are, two things. Yeah. 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 And then we kind of keep coaxing and trying. I, uh, very rarely, I'm a medical doctor and occasionally I have to treat severe insomnia and I might use a, an actual pharmaceutical, but never sure. never medicines like Ambien and stuff like that. We'll use others, but it, occasionally I'll have to do that. But the main thing is the environment and calming the mind and calming the nervous system yep. and getting, I mean, the main issue is just feeling safe. If, as, as long as you don't feel safe, like there's a problem that needs your attention. You will not go to sleep. Your brain's trained to stay awake and stay vigilant. So you have to get to a place where you feel safe. Personally, for me, spiritually, right? Prayer, yeah. reading the Bible. I mean, that, that really gives me comfort and yep. gets rid of a lot of my stress. Yes. I want to go back really quickly and comment just because a lot of our listeners are middle-aged women uh, on the melatonin. I'm with you. I err on the side of caution with that and that melatonin is an aromatase inhibitor, which is why it can be beneficial for breast cancer. It can block estrogen, but in this population, it can induce hot flashes sometimes, especially if mm -hmm. they use too much. So I am cautious with use of melatonin, but I also want to mention if you didn't, the 5-HTP and tryptophan we had just talked about yes, five minutes ago, absolutely. you know, those can help to boost melatonin, serotonin and melatonin. Those can help facilitate the calming sleep pathway. But then the phosphatidylserine you mentioned, that's a phospholipid. We haven't talked a lot about that on um, the show. So just for the listeners, that can help dampen adrenaline, dampen cortisol, that kind of fight or flight. So a lot of patients who do feel revved up at night, taking that can kind of help reset their circadian rhythm and just calm that, that cortisol down that could be peaking at night, but that it needs to be combined with lifestyle meditation, <laughs> prayer, yes. the other things that you're, you're, you'd mentioned. Yeah. And then GABA and theanine. Sometimes I'll try yes. like GABA and theanine and things like that to see if they help. Glycine, just direct glycine supplementation can be yeah. quite helpful or gelatin or, you know, something. I mean, I don't know that drinking a cup of bone broth at that time is going to help you sleep, but like, you know, a little bit of gelatin or uh, just some glycine powder or glycine capsules can also help with sleep as well. Very calming amino acids. Love it. Okay. So we talked about sleep. Let's talk a little bit more about stress. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say there. You've talked about meditation. I know you talk about that in your, your book, yes. deep breathing. Do you want to expand on either of those? Yeah. Bit? I mean, I, I mean, there's a few quick breath trips, tri tricks that can make it really easy for people with this. Yeah. Stress is like, you could do 15 podcasts on stress, right? Because <laughs> Most of the individuals we're working with, good people, hardworking people, but our modern environments have tweaked out our autonomic nervous system. Yeah. I mean, they're way out of balance. And you start looking at heart rate variability and looking at low frequency, high frequency ratios, and you start seeing how out of balance it is. People really need to retune that autonomic nervous system. And I definitely am a big advocate of getting outside as much as possible, mm -hmm. trying to immerse yourself in whatever natural environments you can, and specifically trying to exercise in nature, um, whether it's a walk or a jog or a bike ride or whatever, but go spend time in nature. It does so much just to settle our nervous system. And of course, grounding, but I, I ground every morning in my backyard until my toxic panel showed that I have broadleaf <laughs> pre-emergent herbicide. Oh my gosh. In my urine. And I realized, <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to admit this. We have this back lawn. We play badminton and stuff like that there. And we do actually spray it and try to keep it a nice lawn. And I realized- And I you go stand in it every morning. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I better find out when the chemicals are applied. 
just have them not spray a little patch the patch that you need. Exactly. So anyway, kind of a funny story, but those, those things help. But the back to the breath. So the breath is very powerful, as you know, and I'm going to really simplify it because you can do a ton of different types of breath work and they're really cool. But balanced breathing is just simply symmetrical breathing, breathing in and out at about the same pace and to hit what we call resonance where you kind of get or coherence where you get the brain and the heart, everything tuned up. The typical recommendations is that you slow your breath to about six breaths a minute. And that's a symmetrical form of breathing, typically five seconds in, five seconds out, nose diaphragm, right? Not chest, mouth breathing, nose diaphragm. And that's just a very balancing form of breathing. It's not really sympathetic or parasympathetic. It just calms you down and helps focus you. But if you want to activate your sympathetic nervous system, if you need a little bit of cortisol and adrenaline and you're tired, mm -hmm. then you basically, you breathe in more than you breathe out. It's that simple. You can do that through volume. You can do it through pace, but all you have to do is see to it that you're actually breathing in more than you're breathing out. The, uh, if you want to learn more about this, Dan, uh, Andrew Huberman, his uh, Huberman Lab podcast, he's a Stanford neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. He's taught me more about this than just about anybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's really amazing because he gets into the neuroscience of it and why it happens. Yeah, and yeah. he's really simplified it. But um, essentially- So don't do that if you're trying to calm down. <laughs> right. So if you're trying to get activated, you breathe yeah. in more than you breathe out. The reverse is true for calming yourself down. Breathe out more than you breathe in. And that can be accomplished many ways. You can have a shorter inhale, longer exhale. You can have a long inhale and just a longer exhale. But you actually, ultimately, your net breathing out is longer than you're breathing in. Now, a lot of folks will use what's called 4-8 breathing, real simple. That way they have something to pace it to, you know, and that doesn't mean seconds. It could be, it's just a four count in, eight count out. And sure. some people will use the 4-7-8 where you breathe in for four pause seven seconds and breathe yep. out for eight. That can be yep. too much for people if they don't have good carbon dioxide tolerance, if they've been over breathing, that they'll get short of breath doing that. But that's really good for training carbon dioxide tolerance too, so that they can reset that system. But yeah, if you just tell folks, find the find what feels comfortable and you're not straining, because if you're putting too much effort into it, then it's gonna just it's gonna end up enhancing focus and dopamine. And if you're really just trying to relax, but just breathe out more than you breathe in. Love that. Breathe out more than you breathe in. Okay. Let's go to the environment. Well, we kind of just talked about toxins in your backyard environment. So how does how does our environment impact our health and how we how can we program our environments better to support us rather than erode our health? Yes. Yeah, so you know, for years, I didn't hardly talk about environment at all. And now it's become that and community. Those have been the two things I yeah. talk about more than anything yeah. else, because I think those are the foundation stones of us, you know, we're health advocates and a lot of people are, we're part of a big community. We want to see a, a complete sea change in health in our country, right? We're not just doing this just to work one-on-one -on -one with individuals. We're trying to get a message out there so that the next generation of children growing up can have the opportunity to really experience great health and that human yes. potential isn't going to be thwarted by this. We want this for people because we know how important and how good it is. And I've realized that without community and, and, and focusing on community and environment, it's just not going to happen. You know, you can get individually healthy, but you're still going to have to focus on finding a community that supports that and, and encourages you because it is hard to do in our time and then program your environment and program the environment is not simply cleaning up the environment so it's suitable for a human meaning clean air clean water you know lack of mold all the things i know you teach over and over again i'm sure you've had experts that talk mm -hmm. about that so i won't go into all the toxicants i'm not really an expert there either anyway um but it also means how do you program your environment so you have success with the health behaviors you're trying to engage in um, because most of the time when people don't have success improving their approach to nutrition or physical activity or stress, it's because they didn't program their environment to give them success. Um, so the thing that they need to do isn't easily accessible. And the thing that they don't want to do is way too easy. And so you begin to recreate your food environment around what are your priorities, what are your goals, what are your values for your food? You create your living habitat and your office habitat to promote movement, less sedentary, more movement. You begin to create your lighting environment so that it creates less okay. stress, you know? And so you really start looking at comprehensive environmental programming so that all of the things that you want to do on a daily basis that are gonna just help you get healthier and healthier or just become automated because they're programmed into your environment. Love that. That's what you meant by environment. Love that. Yeah. And and the healthy habitat, right? You sure. Oxygen free, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We talk a lot about that on the podcast. Yes. Yeah. So in your book here, Authentic Health, you teach about mindfulness and how important it is to experience optimal health and well-being. So what what does it mean? I know you talk about being mindful with like our food selection and when we're having cravings and whatnot, but what do you mean by being mindful when it comes to our health? 
Yeah. So the first thing of obviously is that you have to step back and really ask, what are my goals for my health? Because a lot of individuals I've seen, and even right now, a lot of people who seek a consultation with me, they have poor health. They're struggling, right? Yeah. They, you know, it, it could be metabolic, it could be chronic inflammation, it could be all of that, but they're struggling. And, you know, obviously right now, if you just go with our modern cultural flow, for the most part, with the vast majority of our population, all what I think are good people who want to feel good, I'm not blaming anybody or anything like that, you're going to end up in an unhealthy environment. The foods you eat will generally be not good for you, right? They're, they're going to have uh, ingredients that are actually hurting your health, and they're going to have miss ingredients that you need for your health, and they'll have too many calories, and you'll eat too often and all that. You will be more sedentary. You'll sit in your car till you sit in your office chair till you can sit in your car till you get home and sit on your couch and then go to bed, right? I mean, you will. You, our, our environments are programmed to this concept of comfort. You know, you'll never get cold. You'll never get hot, right? So absence of sauna, absence of cold thermogenesis, these things that create greater resiliency and a more comprehensive, you know, expression of who we can be. So the, um, and so we have to like, so obviously if we're mindless about this, if we just go with the flow, the likely endpoint is a state of poor health. Yeah. But because so many people around us are occupying that same state and it's become status quo, we don't think of it as poor health. You know, we're like, oh yeah, I need to work on my blood cholesterol and I should lose a little weight. And in the meantime, you know, I am tired all the time and feel brain foggy and often depressed, but I'm not, because everybody else I know is also, this is just, this is just normal for a human being. You know, so we just normalize it rather than recognize there could be something completely different available to us. So the first thing is in the big picture, you've got to be mindful. You're, you know, you, you know, I think Yogi Berra, the quote is, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but it's like, if you don't know where you're trying to go, uh, it's, you'll end up someplace else. Right. So it's like, what are your actual goals for your health? And that starts with understanding what is the value proposition of health? It's not just your doctor gives you or your nurse practitioner gives you an A because you have good cholesterol and good blood pressure. That's mm -hmm. that doesn't really motivate anybody that much. And that doesn't give you back good health either. Right. And no, you talk right. about that in your book. You talk about you say your yeah. doctor can't give you back your health. So if they prescribe a statin medication and bring your cholesterol down, that doesn't bring your health back. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, you, you know, the value proposition of health is this state of being within a human system where every all cells and tissues are, are, are functioning at an optimal way in the way that they were designed. And so that the actual expression of that is most of the time, barring things you couldn't have controlled for, your mental and physical and emotional well-being are phenomenal. You feel good. You feel able to fully engage in life and find out what is my potential, right? You know, and that's a, that's a euphoric thing when people begin to experience who haven't had. It is like a drug in and of itself. You want to feel that good. And then you automatically program yourself for health because the moment you do something that takes that from you, you're like, well, what was it? Was it what, what did I do? What was this something in my environment? Was this something I ate? I'm not doing that to myself again because this is so much preferable to that. And I know this and you know this because we've both seen lots of folks who arrive at that place. You, we don't have to help them anymore. They'll figure it out all the time because they're so addicted to their good health. They're not going to do anything to give it away. right? Mm -hmm. And that's where we, we try to get people. So you have to start with saying, I want that. right? And in order to have that, then what about my approach to my daily habit matrix has to change? What's keeping me from having that experience? And you have to do the inventory on these yeah. things we've talked about, your environment, your community, your nutrition, your physical activity, your stress, your toxin burden. You have to do that inventory. And it can be very helpful to work with someone like you who can actually get the data to really know where you stand, right? What yes. systems to support, you know, that kind of stuff. But if you can't get that data, you can still do this. And you can still get very close because your body will teach you as you help it to get healthier. And then when it comes to each of those areas, you know, change is challenging. And if you're just working out of your, what I call your lower mind, your <laughs> automated habit programs that are deeply tied into reward systems and memories, you're just going to keep doing what you've always done. The only way you get victory over that is to activate the more powerful cortex of your brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, and begin to train new circuits so that you can actually now be self-deterministic about what is it? How am I going to make progress to my goals? I'm not just a victim of my culture, my habits, and everything yeah. that can for me. I'm the one who decides, you know, how I'm going to do it. And it's a journey, meaning you have some victories and you have some setbacks, but you're just committed to that journey. Now, mindfulness is a deep topic. We could talk about it, all kinds of different forms of mindfulness, but at the end of the day, that's what I'm talking about, mindfulness. About yeah, that. I love that. I, 
I, I told you before we opened or we, before we pushed record today that I read your book so long ago because we met a couple years ago. <laughs> I need to go back and, and read it front to back because it's just so full of just great chunks. But one thing I did write down, something I'd underlined in the book when I had read it, was what you just said was that you know we have to have the courage to want to change our habits. So we need to do an inventory, right? Assess what the pro where the problems lie, but then have the courage to want to make the change. And then you say that it's our responsibility to claim our health for ourselves, right? It's yes. our responsibility to, to do that. It's not our doctors. We have to make those changes. I don't know if you want to expand on that or maybe you just did. <laughs> well, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of times I start by trying to unburden people. They come in feeling ashamed. They believe that their poor health is a consequence of, of their character, their integrity. They've mm. been told that they're too fat. They don't move enough that they would, you know, they eat the wrong foods. And so, you know, the first order of business is to help them understand how all this programming started. And it started, you know, even we know now from epigenetics, it started before when they were a sperm and an ovum. Some of that programming was already starting. Mm -hmm. And help them understand, no, you didn't really consciously choose all this for yourself. You're not in the state because you just consci consciously decided as a young person, this is the state I want to be in. This is something that happened to you. And you, and it doesn't do any good to look at conspiracy theories of food manufacturers and chemical manu. Yeah, we got problems there and, and it's powerful and we got to deal with them. But it doesn't do any good on your individual health to begin to say, well, it's all their fault, right? Or it's the healthcare system's fault or it's my family's fault. You Because blame is a disempowering like emotion. Right. I mean, then you're a victim of other people. And yeah, and yeah. Good. So you really have to get to a point where you're not going to blame anybody and you're not blaming yourself. You fully forgive yourself and recognize this wasn't really ever my conscious intent. This wasn't an expression of who I really am, who I really am actually wants to feel good and get healthy. And, I, and, and but then once you arrive at that point, you do have to take responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's challenging because once you know, you know, and if you choose not to take the journey, you are now willfully choosing to stay in a state of poor health. And that's that can create some cognitive dissonance for folks. But I'm like, you know, all it means is you take one little baby step in the right direction. Most people have years to do this. I mean, some people are so sick, they better do it quick. But most people can do this over years. One baby step, right? And then once that baby step became automated three months later, let's take one more baby step. And then, then that's across the different categories. Like there was one little food substitution. There was one little bit more movement, a little bit more sleep. And we just keep stacking and stacking and stacking until yeah. two or three years later, this person is in a completely different state of health. Love it, love it, love it. I have just a few more questions and we'll wrap up here. So what is authentic health to you? Like what's the definition of authentic health? Why'd you name your book health is, yeah. <laughs> uh, is to be, uh, well, I'm trying to think of the literary fallacy I'm about to use. This is to be authentically healthy. <laughs> but it is that state I described, right? Where your unique human system, right? That has all of its, you know, genetic variants. I mean, you and I both know that 99.5% of our genetics are the same, right? Because we have the same, you know, basic, basic makeup as homo sapiens. But we have these like little tiny variations between you and me that really make a difference in methylation. Phase two detoxification, hormones, right? Macronutrients, how our body, right? Like we have, we, we can, we can get those blueprints for people so that instead of homogenizing everything, they can begin to individualize and get their best expression. And so for me, being authentically healthy, I, I alluded to it earlier when I talked about the value proposition of health. It is that I am attending to my human system to the best of my ability so that all of those systems that might need a little help and support are getting the help and support they need. They're not, and that all the systems that are robust are as robust as they can be. So that the entire human system is working in an optimal fashion so that every single day I am experiencing the, the highest possible level of emotional, physical, and cognitive well-being that I can experience. And, and then to keep exploring that potential because we have so much untapped potential as human beings. So, I mean, there is, our genetics are so more, comp, have some, there's, there's, they're so comprehensive, right? Like human beings can become free divers. They can actually train the mammalian dive reflex and go hundred feet under the sea for five minutes. Now I'm not gonna do that, but that potential exists it's to some there. extent. Yeah. Right? And then they can go walk up a 20,000 foot mountain or they can figure out cognitively how to go into space and study and do, right? Like we had these amazing potentials really God given potentials to, you know, to really create good, good things, right? We're supposed to use them the right way. And most of us are not coming close to exploring those potentials because we're coming nowhere close to an optimal state of health. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. Love it. We want that authentic health. Okay. 
I got to ask one final question and then we'll kind of wrap up here. Um, can you give us an example, a case example? I mean, you went over a lot, obviously, that you work with your patients, what you dive into, how to get them back to metabolic health. Can you give us an example of some things that maybe one of your patients changed that took responsibility for themselves, changed some habits, and the transformation that they had? Yeah, I could give you a lot of those, but I will, since we we're talking about metabolic health, we'll just go with that. I had a recent case. 49-year-old uh, female, lovely person, fairly disciplined in her life, but had been carrying probably 50 pounds for too long, but she carried it well. Um, she ended up, uh, I, it was, she, she came to me later, but she went through some blood testing. It had been about 18 months since she'd had a checkup. The last checkup, everything looked okay. And her doctor called her highly concerned. Her fasting blood glucose was over 400. He added an A1C. It was over 14. Uh, her, she wasn't at that point, like her all of her basic metabolics like sodium and potassium and kidney function were fine. So she wasn't like a critical case. You got to send into the hospital or something of that sort. But essentially she found out that with 18 months, she progressed to that level. And it's interesting because the first instinct of a medical doctor would be, this is type two diabetes. This person is overweight, but we know that nobody develops type two diabetes with that level of glycemic dysregulation in 18 months, right? We know there's a beta cell component and there is a condition of late, uh, um, late onset autoimmune diabetes in an adult where they actually have a mixture potentially of insulin resistance and compromised beta cell function. And so she went to an endocrinologist who immediately suggested what we would typically suggest insulin therapy, right? And we, insulin therapy is very expensive and time tested. So she ran it, she curbsided me because she's a friend and ran it by me. And I was like, look, you may end up needing insulin. I don't know. I haven't looked at your C peptide levels, your insulin levels, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. I got all that data and it turned out she had just gone into menopause within the last year, mm -hmm. uh, completely undetectable reproductive hormones. She had been catabolic for about three months because she'd been losing weight and getting tired because of the hyperglycemia. Her growth hormone was down, like down to like a, a 50, right? And, and so that, so we know that she was experiencing this sort of chronic catabolic stimulus. Thyroid was definitely not optimal. It wasn't technically abnormal, but the TSH was like four, free T3 was like 2.2. So, you know, we, yeah, we yeah. were seeing a lot, yeah, a lot of the endpoints. So it was yeah. a real good comprehensive case. And I told her, I've been looking at data for this specific form of diabetes. And yes, you do have insulin resistance, but you primarily have lost your beta cell function, but you still have some. When I tested her C-peptide and insulin, she still had some. Inappropriately low for the level of hyperglycemia, but she still had it. I was like, I think if you could follow a ketogenic diet, you might be able to stabilize this and avoid insulin. Uh, it looked, I just found a study and it did show, of course, improvement in insulin resistance, but it actually showed improvement in the health of the beta cells on ketogenic diets. They hadn't been able to measure that the production of the beta cells improved, but they saw all these markers that the beta cells might be healthier and being re reinvigorated. So she did it. It's hard to do this, right? But she went 100% ketogenic, committed, quit all alcohol. She wasn't a heavy drinker, but she drank wine on the weekends, quit all alcohol. And, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll flash forward. We did also start bioidentical hormone replacement. I actually did use a growth hormone secretagogue peptide to give her some mm -hmm. growth hormone mm -hmm. stimulus. She had some targeted supplements, uh, cleaned up some of the diet. And six months later, her A1C is 5.5. Wow. Yeah, her fasting blood glucose is 80. Her continuous glucose monitor shows a consistent range of 70 to 110. No drugs. I mean, yeah, well, hormones. Well, I know yeah. I did use an SGLT2 SGLT inhibitor. I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with yeah. those, mm -hmm. but, they, you know, but, you know, ultimately now she doesn't need it because she's not urinating out any glucose because her glucose is so well controlled. But I did use that in the beginning because I was just trying to get sure. any edge I could. She's not on any drugs now. And that's, that's amazing. That's yeah. incredible. But so she did that, meaning she disciplined herself yes. to go from a standard diet to a ketogenic diet, low carb. And, and did it and completely through the diet itself. And then after a few months, once growth hormone had come up and reproductive, we, we got her into the gym and got her strength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because she was losing lean body mass, but she did it and she did not need insulin therapy and still does not need insulin therapy. And she has better blood sugar than most of my regular patients who don't have LADA. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Happy well, and blessed that she had yeah. that connection to you that saved her from what could have been a very different test. So what is your absolute top longevity tip? And then we'll get into where listeners can find you. All right. So there's a ton of them and they're all important, but my top one is spend a lot more time outside. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Do you live in the mountains? You're in North Carolina. Are you? I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. Okay. So I do live in the mountains. You get to hike and yeah. Yeah. I got to relocate. Not, not now. eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Spend a lot more time outside, explore nature, you know, turn it off. Vitamin yeah. N, get your vitamin N, nature. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, I hear you have an incredible free gift for our listeners. So why don't you share that with our audience? Yeah, so about a, a year and a half ago, the book that you've been talking about, Authentic Health, that I wrote, um, I did make it available free, uh, not the hard copy that's available on Amazon and places like that. But the ebook, which you can download onto a Kindle or an iPad, is free um, on a website. It's ebook.drgusvickery.com, not www, just ebook.drgusvickery.com, and the audio file. So I did. It had, we have an audible version. Now you can't put the audible version on there, so they're like MP3 files, and files that you have to download. But if you'd rather listen to the book, you can download those files. So that's free for anybody who'd like to explore it. Incredible and very generous. So thank you so much. We will definitely post that link in the show notes. And you have one more gift to share. <laughs> Yeah, so by the you know by the time this podcast comes out, I did, and I'll keep this very short. But essentially, the book got a lot of positive you know reviews. People were really helped by it, the simplicity of it, the action steps. It helped them feel good about themselves. But I also realized I could make it shorter and simpler because over time I received feedback about what were the things that helped people the most in these different areas I wrote about, and I thought you know I can make this smaller, shorter, simpler. So that folks who are intimidated by reading a book over 200 pages will just feel like, oh, I got it. I got exactly what I need. But I also had this, I feel really goofy when I talk about this, but I, it was more like a spiritual revelation. I felt like I should tell it in the form of a story. So mm -hmm. I've been working on that and, and it's done. It's just got copy editing. But basically there's a short book that takes all those essential truths from the first book, simplifies them and presents them in the form of an engaging adventure story. And so, and that's going to always be free. It's just my way of trying to get the message out to as many people as possible. Um, and, and so I wrote that to give away and I'm just sharing it with, you know, any platforms that I share with and saying, please download it. If you like it, you think it's really a great way to understand this material, read it to your children, share it with your friends and family. You know, hopefully we'll get a lot of folks engaged in this message and they'll make this decision and we'll build this incredible health community and program our environments together and all have good health. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for those gifts. And thank you for coming on the show today and just reminding us that we get to choose, right? We can avoid change and stay sick or we can courageously start our journey back to authentic health. So thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Thank you for all the work you're doing. <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. This was great. Yeah.